So how do you optimize then the redox state of the cytoplasm? Okay. One of the biggies is calcium. Okay. The more calcium you get inside your cell, the unhealthier you get fast. Okay. This is why calcium <clears throat> channel blockers work as well as they do and why calcium channel blockers decrease all-cause mortality. Think about that. You have probably the only prescription drug there is, uh, calcium channel blockers, long-acting. Because of the fact that they lessen calcium levels inside the cell, they make every cell in your body healthier. If they didn't make every cell in your body healthier, how could they reduce the chance of death from all diseases? Not just heart disease, not just cancer, not just this. If you have something that decreases your chance of dying from any, anything and everything, it means it's having a specific profound effect on all of the cells of the body and generally on something that all of the cells in the body share as pathology, which in this case is increased calcium. Uh, <clears throat> after doing all the research for my book, Death by Calcium, I, I can tell you with great conviction there does not exist a pathology where there's not increased intracellular oxidative stress and that that oxidative stress is always earmarked, caused by, and associated with an increased intracellular calcium level, okay? You may not have enough calcium in your bones, in your osteoporotic bones, that does not mean you have a body-wide calcium deficiency. Virtually nobody except for people with parathyroid problems have a true calcium deficiency, okay? I think the evidence is absolutely clear cut that taking any form of calcium on a regular basis is just going to lower your all-cause mortality for the reasons I talked about, increase your chances of cancer and heart disease, <clears throat> and uh, promote calcium deposition throughout your body. I mean, why do we get calcium deposits? We got calcium deposits because we got too damn much calcium in our body, okay? It's not, in that sense, it's not rocket science. Also, calcium inside the cell, as I said, is a primary regulator of oxidative stress. <clears throat> and the only way we, we heard about earlier about magnesium. Magnesium is a very interesting and probably, and this is from senior vitamin C here, magnesium is probably your most important supplement. Okay? Why? Well, number one, you absolutely need magnesium for hundreds, if not thousands, of different enzymatic reactions. Uh, but it serves as a physiological calcium regulator, all right? You can't have high both. If you have a high calcium, your magnesium's low. If your magnesium gets, gets up and you're able to get it up, you push the calcium down, okay? So that's, that's the secret to its longevity. And nothing can do magnesium's job for it. But, I mean, obviously, I think everybody here should take tons of vitamin C. But for the sake of argument, if you were only going to take one supplement, it'd be magnesium because other antioxidants can partially compensate for vitamin C. Nothing's going to compensate for the important things that are going on with magnesium. Now, and they've even studied specific toxins. They're all pro-oxidant, and when they're in some animal studies and cell studies, when they actually look, they can see that as the, as the cell gets more toxic, as the toxin exerts its effect, in this case methylmercury, it again elevates intracellular calcium. So even though calcium is a key element, I mean, it's an essential nutrient. You die without calcium, but you only need a very limited amount. And above that limited amount, it turns from a nutrient into a toxin. Cell death secondary to toxicity is always associated with the highest of intracellular calcium levels. 
And when they get really high really quick, that's when you get frank necrosis or rupture, rupture of the cell. When they elevate more gradually, that's when you initiate programmed cell death or apoptosis. Okay. Um, Now let's talk about some mitochondrial support agents. And there's actually a bunch of them. You know, when you're seeing different supplements that are uh, promoted as support agents for good, healthy mitochondria, oftentimes it's a combination of some of these. Vitamin C, of course, number one. Number two, vitamin B1, thiamine, helps get more acetyl coenzyme A, which is essential to initiate the Krebs cycle, generating energy inside the mitochondria. <clears throat> Pantothenic acid. This one is big. This one is big and is very, very underemphasized. Okay? Without pantothenic acid, you can't synthesize coenzyme A and the other two components of which is ATP and cysteine. And it's absolutely essential for the Krebs cycle in generating energy. And the interesting thing about that is that it appears to have a little bit of an analogy to vitamin C in that it's something that we're grossly underdosed on. Okay, I mean, you can't take super mega large amounts of every vitamin. Some of them you really need to stay in the supplementation range. But <clears throat> vitamin C, vitamin K, uh, pantothenic acid, these, pretty much the higher you push them, the better your energy production gets. Now, very important, regular pantothenic acid comes as calcium pantothenate, so you don't want to take mega dosing of calcium pantothenate or you're getting too much calcium. <clears throat> they have another form of pantothenic acid which is called, as you see up there, pantothene. And pantothene is two pantothenic molecules hooked together without any other calcium associated. So that would be the form to supplement on. <clears throat> Vitamin B2, very important in mitochondrial energy metabolism dysfunction. Coenzyme Q10. It's an actual component of the electron transport chain along the mitochondrial cristae. Then a, a weird one I never heard of until I did this research called edebinone, which is a synthetic derivative of CoQ10 and a very powerful antioxidant that's also been used in specifically dealing with some of the inherited mitochondrial diseases in lessening the oxidative stress in the mitochondria. <clears throat> L-carnitine, uh, creatine, D-ribose. Another one that's getting a lot of play these days is NADH, okay, which, you know, for lack of a better word, really powers the process and pushes, pushes uh, the electron transfer chain to completion. Uh, as Dr. Saul talked about, the tocopherols, vitamin E, very important. They have a uh, prescription medicine, dichloroacetate, that's exceptionally, exceptionally potent. Uh, so there, we, don't, don't get into the, the habit of just thinking all mainstream medicine is garbage, okay? A lot of it is, no doubt about it. But a little bit of it isn't, okay? So always sift the facts and make an objective evaluation. Look at the science that's involved, whether it's a nutrient or whether a prescription medication. Alpha lipoic acid, extremely important. <clears throat> and acetylcysteine, which is the rate limiting amino acid in the synthesis, synthesis of glutathione. Omega 3 fatty acids, resveratrol, and then there's our buddy again, magnesium. And then, uh, an odd little thing, this antioxidant that's very good called PQQ. Now, supplements to avoid. 
Uh, iron, copper, and calcium, what do I call the toxic nutrients? Are they essential for life? Absolutely. Are they essential for death? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, these are, for example, in the case of iron. Oh, God, on the case of iron. I mean, doggone United States in 1945 opened the floodgates to throwing iron into every fortified food there is, and the rest of the damn world followed suit. Okay, and everybody on this planet is iron toxic because our public health authorities thought it was horrible that children starving in third world countries had iron deficiency anemia, okay? <clears throat> you're never gonna get iron deficiency anemia on the diets that you're on. But if you do, that's the one and only circumstance in which you supplement iron, and you only supplement it in until your anemia is resolved. Don't do it prophylactically. All you're gonna do is, uh, and if, uh, let me give you a little something. If you haven't seen it last time, I think I talked about it. Go to YouTube, type in Dr. Levy Iron Video. Dr. Levy Iron Video. And you'll certainly never eat a bowl of cereal again unless it's organic. Copper, <clears throat> copper is like a junior iron. It's another primary upregulator of oxidative stress. And then calcium, we've talked about that. Basic supplementation then. Basic supplementation is, first I like to call the big four, all right? And the big four are the big four because of actually what they do to calcium metabolism inside your body. Uh, magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker. You pretty much take as much of that as, as you can adjust your bowels to tolerating with. Vitamin D3 to a rough level of 50 to 80 nanogram per cc. Vitamin C, we know, and vitamin K. Now think about this. Each one of these supplements by themselves decrease all-cause mortality. Each one of them is going to decrease your chance of dying from anything, which once again means that each one of these four things is positively impacting oxidative stress-wise every cell in your body. Uh, lysine and proline, these are very good for helping to reverse whatever atherosclerosis sclerosis you have going. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids mixed to cofferols. Uh, Dr. Saul has talked about that. B-complex. Uh, a lot of the Bs you might want to take larger amounts, but don't, don't get out of the habit of taking at least some of all of them. Very important for nearly everybody to supplement iodine, okay, and potassium iodide. Now, <clears throat> You know, everybody, lots of people write me emails and they say, well, how much do I take of this? How much? For most things, and certainly for vitamin C, there is, isn't remotely, isn't remotely a one-size-fits-all. Why? Because everybody's toxicity is different. So the more toxins you have, if you can't get rid of the toxins or block them from coming in, the more vitamin C you need. Okay? So... You, you basically take what you could afford. You can take what makes you feel better. You can take what makes abnormal blood work less abnormal or normalize. Those are your basic parameters. And a biggie, super, super, super biggie, CRP, C-reactive protein, okay? They have the reference range of CRP as being zero to three. No way. If you've got a CRP above one, you need to start working on things. I mean, your, P, your CRP, which is a direct measure of the general body-wise increased inflammatory oxidative stress you have in your body, directly related to increased all-cause mortality. The higher it is, the sooner you're going to die from any particular disease. It's one of your cheapest, best ways to, uh, to keep track as to whether or not what you're doing is getting the job done. Uh, 
Now, just uh, two more slides here and we'll have it wrapped. Now, remember what I said earlier about increased intracellular vitamin C. Perhaps a synonym for that is what I call a score-based saturation. That's always your goal with vitamin C, if possible. And remember, when, you're, when just taking regular vitamin C, it'll still get where it needs to go, but the liposome encapsulated vitamin C can get there even quicker and can give a unique degree of access to the intracellular organelles like the mitochondria directly. Finally, the multi-C protocol, okay? Uh, I think you realize by now I'm just not a C does everything, don't do anything else. I mean, it's, it's important to have a, a broad spectrum of things that you're doing that are positively supporting your immune system and decreasing your body-wide oxidative stress. Well, <clears throat> so the multi-C protocol, if you're not getting the result that you want with just one form of vitamin C, don't conclude all is lost and you can't still achieve the effect that you want, you take multiple forms. Certainly, you should always take the top two. Take the oral liposome encapsulated, I think I've discussed with the unique delivery properties of getting it inside your cells without the consumption of energy, and clinically being more powerful much of the time than IV vitamin C in equivalent doses, so just taking a gram or two or three a day of that is like taking 15, 16 grams of regular C. But number two is the sodium ascorbate. You work on a sodium ascorbate dose until you find out roughly what your bowel tolerance is, and you take close to that every day. Some people it'll be five grams, some people it'll be 15 grams, some people it'll be 50 grams, okay? But it neutralizes toxins directly forming in your gut. And believe me, one of the biggest things that bring your health down is, uh, uh, is maldigested food producing the same type of toxins that you see in a pathological mouth. So you get that C in high concentration in your gut, and what does get absorbed goes straight directly into the rich supply of immune cells surrounding the gut. Ascorbyl palmitate is good. It's fat-soluble. Intermittent IV, always very good. I'm definitely not talking against IV when I tell you that an equivalent dose of liposome encapsulated is probably better because each does different things. And then finally, intramuscular, okay? Intramuscular, intravenous goes like that, in and out. Intramuscular, even though it might just be a couple grams, goes like that and gives you a nice sustained release. So Dr. Klenner cured a lot of babies with intramuscular at a dose not nearly close to the type of dose that he used intravenously. So use all your weapons. And there's my email and website. Thank you very much.